Uh, good afternoon. Is everyone um, reinvigorated? Excellent. Good to see. And um, I didn't see anyone out on the lawn practicing their rowing skills. I'm disappointed taking some of it back. Although Anne did um, uh, recount to me very uh, early on um, about uh, um, a little uh, poem by Probably John Macefield. John Macefield that she learned in, a, in a, her very early on and it mentioned quinquireens uh, carting uh, animals um, you know, back to Rome etc. So apes and peacocks. Apes and peacocks and the yeah. part of and elephants especially, and the part of the reason why you wouldn't use a transport, unlike Noah's Ark with 44 days, um, is that they'd be fairly quick uh, from North Africa to, um, um, or wherever they came from, probably North Africa. Distant over. Okay, there we are. So, all right, I'm going, I'm going to look this up because I'm intrigued now. It's all right. I, I have, I have, I do have Google rather than failing memories. So, I, I will look up that poem because it's very interesting that these little verses hold some of those recounts to um, Roman history two thousand years ago. You know, it's just absolutely amazing. John, John Macefield. I'm going to look this up because that's of interest. Um, I was asked a question about uh, ri the rhythm of the oars and things like that. Um, basically, it's a, a four-phase four process um, about, you know, obviously you've got to get the, the oar into the water, you've got to pull against um, the water, then you've got to take it out, then you've got to recover, i.e. take it back to that first position and then put it back. And it was a, a four-stage process. So uh, there were a number of those songs and mantras that uh, they used just to get into that uh, four um, you know, stanza rhythm and that they would repeat multiple times. And as I said before, you can obviously make that a little bit quicker if you're in battle. I suspect those sorts of stanzas and those songs um, and as I said one uh, uh, was recently um, uh, been able to um, uh, be transcribed in its full uh, and went for about uh, 16 minutes or something like that so it would just be repeated and it would generally be used for those long cruises rather than the battle thing because I think you'd be focused on on that drum as sort of and training crews in those days were, you know, you'd obviously have experienced oarsmen and they would probably be a little close to the centre or perhaps even on the, on the inboard oar because they'd actually then control it and then others followed. And I don't think it would take too long to train them um, because you'd know very quickly when you were out of sync. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, I do actually remember in my early studies reading something about a rowing machine that they made and the uh, Romans were wonderful engineers so it wouldn't surprise me through ropes and pulleys and a bit of uh, wood technology that they'd set up the benches and uh, put the oars on and you could just practice getting into that rhythm of it and once you've got that established your muscle memory and your time and it wouldn't take you too long once you've been doing that either on a lake or even uh, with the machine you probably drill on a machine then go onto a lake and then go into sea and then you go into battle one would hope anyway uh, training programs were probably a little more driven by the enemy rather than uh, training uh, authorities anyway we'll talk about uh, Roman naval ascendancy um, uh, and I think it's driven by the three uh, naval battles of the first Punic war which we'll I'll now run through um, and this is where my Latin may let me down. The Battle of Mylae, um, 260 B, uh, BCE, Battle of Cape of uh, Economus, and uh, the Battle of Agates in 241. So they're the three battles that we're just going to cover. I'm just going to situate um, that for you, uh, give you a bit of background on it, cover the battles, mention about the uh, um, the, the number of forces and a brief account of each and, uh, uh, and then summarise the, uh, the end of each of the battles and then do a, a bit of an aftermath or what happened uh, at the end and then I'll be happy to take questions from you. Not complex ones. Um, <laughs> sorry. If I don't know I'll get back to you, just leave me your email, it'll be fine. <laughs> okay, a bit of background to the Punic Wars. Um, 265 BC, the first um, Punic War uh, against Carthage. 
Um, Carthage was the preeminent naval power of the region and had been uh, for some time. I'll show you a little map shortly and you'll, it'll just j <coughs> sorry, jump into relief for you uh, as to why he, they were uh, a naval power and needed to be. Uh, Sicily at the time was part of the Carthaginian Empire um, and posed a direct threat to Rome, uh, predominantly because of the ports that were there. And as I mentioned to you before, ancient shipping is all about capturing ports within one's day's uh, sailing. If you can comfortably take your ship and row it to a port and then you can uh, basically hop along the coast all around the Mediterranean or across seas etc and you're at fairly low risk uh, of getting uh, sunk and you can get you know, are well provisioned and rested and you can do any necessary repairs it was an, a normal pro um, process and of course that was later extended when uh, you know the, the sailing ships um, the distances got further and then the coal ships needed coal stations and you'll see you know over history the, the ports but in these days it was one day's rowing because that was something that you could guarantee um, and Sicily posed a threat to, um, to Rome because of those ports being so close uh, to the Roman mainland uh, sources of grain were available from Sardinia and Sicily and the Straits of Messina which are not very far apart um, separated Sicily uh, and the Roman mainland and you'll see that in the map very shortly um, just a bit of background also um, this is open to a bit of conjecture um, in 260 BCE a Carthaginian ship, a Quinquireme, was beached and captured uh, and was reportedly disassembled. The Romans, as you all know, were great engineers, great engineers, and they copied and it is, in theory it became the uh, template for Roman, uh, Roman warships. So this, um, uh, this ship was basically taken apart, each of the pits, the pieces were numbered, uh, build your ship by numbers, separated, duplicated, and they then were able to take copy that piece of wood ten times and uh, like this do that number one goes to number two number three three a four b you know if you built a model you'll you, you understand and uh, even Lego will do it and they, they made this you know, this template and again uh, were able to build ships uh, at a fairly rap rapid rate and I looked up the the, the time um, each ship took about six thousand uh, man hours to build 6,000 man hours. There's ways of shortcutting that um, because, of course, if you've got 6,000 men, it's only, it doesn't take you too long to do it. And if you've got 200, it takes, you know, you just divide 200 into 6. Uh, but of course, you can't build the top part until you've built the bottom part. So, you know, there are limitations. You'd have them all standing around so it's a bit longer. But um, conceptually, of course, you're only limited to manpower, which the Romans were not that short of, a bit of technology which the Romans were not short of, a bit of motivation and enthusiasm, which the Romans were not short of, and access to a range of skilled um, uh, shipwrights, which, uh, be, uh, with Italy being uh, um, surrounded by sea and a number of allies like Greek and uh, city-states, etc., were able to support them, uh, they were able to reach in and um, um, grab those shipwrights and, and coordinate them as well. So uh, we'll get a comment on that uh, later about how many ships they were able to build reportedly in such a short time. Um, the, per the point I'd just like to make about the conjecture about the ship is obviously the Carthaginians had been sailing around the Mediterranean for quite some time so the Romans wouldn't have just suddenly discovered the ship they would have been aware of it but trying to replicate one from visually looking at it etc so the Carthaginians would have been fairly um, uh, you know, careful about not letting the Romans uh, know too much about how they were built etc and of course um, uh, other nations would have built similar sized ships but not because they were fairly expensive uh, but were not as common and around so uh, the Romans were certainly aware of them uh, but this ship falling into their lap would have just given them such an opportunity to just uh, duplicate it. Um, so reportedly by, um, uh, that they built 120 modern ships in 60 days. So that's 120 ships in 60 days. So just to, that's 105s, 
so things of this size, and 23, so the, you know, like the triremes, 20 of those three, so um, that's 120 ships, etc. But when you think about, you know, the capacity to do that in basically two months, you initially go, oh, no, that's impossible, but then a bit of pre-planning and organisation and the resources of an entire empire at war, um, you know, you'd probably say, even if you doubled that, that's still pretty impressive. So um, the numbers at the end of the day, the number of ships is not in contest, it's just how long they did, they did it. And it's indicative of, regardless, even if you use that as guidance, um, certainly um, um, a guide uh, as to how many ships that they could build at a rapid rate. It's got implications later. Because obviously, if you can replace those losses at that similar rate, you probably risk manage um, the conflicts. It's sort of, or as if you, uh, um, for example, I think it took um, the Greeks um, four years to get their fleet up to um, 300 or so. So in that sort of context, because they were building like 25 um, ships every sort of you know quarter or so, uh, and they were losing some and um, replacing them. And the other advantage, um, not, it's not only about building the ships, it's about making sure you've got crews. Um, and again, the Empire is big enough that early on you can have uh, allied sailors and newly trained uh, Roman crews. You can certainly grab infantrymen and teach them, because our infantrymen, we're not very clever, but we can lift heavy things. And certainly a four section row stroke, even infantrymen can do quite easily. So getting trained, and they were all fit and uh, strong men. So most of them anyway. So this is uh, the area of operations uh, that you uh, which can have a look at. Um, and the purple is uh, Carthage. You can see why they needed to be a, uh, a naval state. Uh, and we're obviously just looking at the west of the Mediterranean. There's some issues with the east of the Med, but uh, we'll leave that alone at the moment. And of course, Italy uh, state there, and Syracuse is um, a separate um, city state. Yeah, we'll just look at that a bit closer. It all about, revolves around Sicily, and fundamentally, Sicily was the prize. Initially, um, uh, the war was declared over some minor, um, uh, minor, almost mercenaries getting involved in in the battle. And like many, many wars that were, and some of the ones that were to come uh, later in in recent history. Um, the bigger nations, Carthage, Carthage and Rome, went to support minor city-states who they'd had some allegiance to. Um, the troops were in close proximity and before long they were fighting each other and uh, we've got uh, a major war between Carthage and Rome. There was a number of sea treaties that had been signed, so Carthage had recognised the need for uh, Rome to be a maritime state uh, as well, um, but Carthage obviously wanted to uh, maintain supremacy. Um, and they just maintained a larger, much more effective navy, and it took a little bit of time, and in fact, uh, the Carthaginian War in Sicily uh, was in fact the catalyst that um, created uh, the Roman navy as such. So the Battle of uh, Mile, um, this was the first um, naval battle between Carthage and Rome, and it basically resulted from the, the powers, um, both of the powers, uh, seeking to re retain control and dominate the sea approaches to, um, to Sicily in, in order primarily to uh, get their land forces, because it was all about in those days the land battles, capturing cities, capturing ports, um, kicking off um, the enemy and you know, owning the, the territory and then expanding. It was all about expansion. So, uh, and the navy was very subservient. Um, and uh, it, its primary task was to just escort the transports and get the shipping, uh, uh, the troops to, onto the land so that they could fight their land battles. Um, the the uh, Mala area is just north of Sicily in uh, what's now known as Milazzo, and that's the area there from a nice little map. So that's where the first naval battle um, uh, occurs. And uh, it was pretty much an encounter between two naval forces bringing in troops and reinforcements uh, and trying to establish naval supremacy in that area so that they could land unhindered. Opposing forces, uh, Carthage naval, naval commander was Hannibal Gisco, 
Apparently Carthage, uh, I don't know too much about Carthage, but nearly all of the commanders are named Hannibal. Um, so this is not the guy with the elephants. In fact, we'll speak very briefly on the, the reason why Hannibal had to go the long way round to invade Rome was because by then uh, that Rome had naval ascendancy and they couldn't do what so many other Carthaginian uh, generals had done, which is just sail across straight into Rome. Uh, they possessed 130-odd ships. Um, one of the key takeaways when you read this history and about the naval combat is that they were supremely overconfident, and quite rightly so. Na Rome's navy was just barely in its infancy. They hadn't any de demonstrable uh, successes, and um, you know Carthage had been doing this for hundreds of years. Rome, uh, the consuls uh, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio and Gaius Julius, um, were in charge at the time and uh, Scipio initially had control of the navy um, but he went on an abortive little um, escapade to uh, um, try and interdict some of the uh, Carthaginian ships and his first encounter at the Lipari Islands if I, I'll just go back if I can I'll show you the Lipari Islands for you Lipari Islands stuff's up in here um, and again, remember what I said about day's trip. So obviously the Carthaginian ships had got close to Miley by going up to the L L Lipari Islands and just parking there, unloading, preparing their ships for battle. Um, and one of the things I've said to you before is you want to go from this with all the sails and everything off to a stripped down ship to make you uh, more, com more mobile, reduces top weight, allows you manoeuvrability. So that's probably what they were doing um, when they got to those islands is preparing their ships for battle. Um, anyway, um, Scipio led this, um, this small fleet to the Lipari Islands and he promptly lost uh, 17 uh, odd ships in short, uh, quick um, uh, succession. Um, the ships predominantly being um, sunk in uh, either being ramming or loss of oars, etc. But uh, they were very swiftly dealt with and uh, shortly after um, um, Julius uh, was appointed the naval commander. Um, and under his command, he had 120 ships. I think that was, um, he probably only had 103 after the first uh, the battle. Um, and uh, obviously there was a bit of a discussion uh, about this first encounter with the uh, Carthaginian navy uh, because uh, uh, the, the next battle uh, we will see, um, the major battle, was in fact was where the Corvus, which is that big 11 metre, 4 metre wide plank with a great spike on, uh, was fitted to the Roman ships. Um, how many? Uh, doesn't quite say, uh, but one suggestion would be uh, the majority of the ships would have had uh, the Corvus spike on them. The Corvus fitted anyway. Anyway, um, Julius met Hannibal um, north of uh, Marle, you know, pretty much open sea. And the Car Carthaginians um, expected victory. Um, they had the sea experience. And the previous uh, Lipari Island ex um, encounter, they were, would have been very confident. Um, so they, were, they apparently were not in any battle formation at all. So extended line, which is just you know groups of ships, probably from relatives and friends, just all m moving through the sea area, um, coming to uh, encounter the, uh, the Romans. Uh, the first engagement was a pretty much a head-on clash, so one fleet versus the other. The Romans would have been in some form of battle formation. Uh, Vs and Ls were not in common uh, formation uh, ways, mainly so that you could drive a wedge and split uh, ships' uh, formations and uh, start to uh, pick them off one at a time. Um, one of the mo most common naval tactics was to have one ship attempt a, uh, a feigned attack against uh, one ship and while they were trying to avoid that, the, other s the second ship would then come in. So they tried to operate in pairs. Um, but with the overconfidence that um, the Carthaginians had, uh, they just went straight for the Roman ships uh, en masse. And, uh, you know, the whole point was to destroy, to firstly ram them, because that was the principal way of destroying uh, ships, destroying oars and things like that. So uh, they, they came in and got very, very close to the, uh, the Romans, because uh, you have to, to ram them. And um, the Romans, uh, through a bit of luck and a bit of seamanship, were able to engage using the Corvus and board uh, the lightly armed uh, Carthaginian ships. 
as a consequence, the Romans had prepared for battle as well because they had a majority of marines on their, uh, on their ships. They were trained with the, the Corvus and um, very swiftly uh, the Carthaginians found themselves that the first 30 odd ships had been captured. So the important thing is that they were captured. There's not so much about them being sunk. So capturing was clearly an indicator that this Corvus and the marines uh, was working very, very quickly because, uh, as I said, the small numbers of um, Carthaginian soldiers on board and certainly their crews would have been very quickly dealt with by armed legionaries in close combat, one of the specialties. Um, shortly after a, a further 20 ships were taken, Hannibal decided there's something wrong with our ships today um, and apparently withdrew. Um, ironically, and much to um, Hannibal's chagrin and the glory of Rome, um, was that Hannibal's flagship would have been one of the biggest sixes, as in this size large, uh, had been captured and he was seen um, escaping in, they say a rowboat, it wouldn't have been, it would have been one of the Liburna type equivalent fast ships, but um, the mere fact that he had to vacate his now in Roman hands uh, flagship uh, would have been extremely hard uh, to deal with. Um, and as a consequence, um, Uh, it resulted in the first substantial naval Roman battle, uh, the first substantial naval victory in this um, first major encounter between the Carthaginians um, and the Romans. So I expect lots of red wine, not necessarily diluted with water, was celebrated in the, the Roman um, uh, halls that night, and not much in those Lipari Islands. I think they would have been uh, licking their wounds, thinking, oh, we, you know, there, there would have been a bit of shell shock there, I think. Um, Julius returned to Sicily and lifted the Carthaginian siege, siege of Segesta, so which is what his primary role was to do. And he received first Rome, Rome's first naval triumph and a victory column uh, raised in the forum. He had captured 31 ships and sunk 13. What happened to those 31 ships? Suddenly become Roman. Quick paint job, new flag, thank you very much. Um, some of the crew may have uh, decided to join them, uh, um, join the Romans, because they don't care as long as they're getting paid, but obviously if they were true Carthaginians, uh, they'd have been probably be, uh, put to the sword or sold as slaves from off their off the rent. Um, but so now the Romans said now, uh, the Romans lost, I think, about 20-odd ships, so they would have certainly replaced their 31 um, well, th th certainly replaced, um, you know, uh, their lost ships and increased their fleet uh, by 31. Um, the unlucky Hannibal uh, lost uh, some more ships in Sardinia, obviously a few other small naval campaigns and probably a bit of bad weather but you know the, the Carthaginians were good seamen so they were able to deal uh, with that and unfortunately he was crucified for his incompetence. I, you know, I know it's tough. Well, <laughs> we just give you the gold card now and say that we'll fly you back and forwards and do the... Um, I think our politics, sorry, I better not care. Um, <laughs> general's performance was measured uh, and they were amply rewarded for success but obviously dealt with, um, with, with uh, certainly the Carthaginians' expense. So I think failure is, um, he probably should have gone down with his flagship, I would have thought. Um, so I just simply say that the Roman Navy had arrived uh, and I think it was there to stay. So, um, the aftermath of all of that was certainly the morale of the Roman navy at that time would have just gone through the roof. They had come up and encountered the preeminent naval uh, um, uh, of the Carthaginian navy, encountered them in a first massive battle, which visually, when you look at it, you know, 120 ships on a horizon in, in that series, the chaos of that first battle, success after success after success, and the enemy admiral sailing off in a uh, Liburna boat off, uh, off into the distance, and, um, you know, uh, the Romans coming back with, I nearly said us, uh, the, oh, that's the advantage, Victor victory, um, you know, gains lots of people. Um, so, um, yeah, they'd have certainly gone back, being victorious, morale would have been improved and they would have validated their battle tactics and uh, certainly the outcome of that would have been uh, an improved state in the Navy. Uh, and conversely, the um, uh, Carthaginians um, would have been probably a bit, um, as I said, shell-shocked about that. Battle Cape um, Economists in 256, so not too long after. Uh, this is the second naval uh, battle. 
Um, when I say major battle, uh, you must remember there'd been lots of these little encounters with low burners and small squadrons that are vying for um, you know, possession. They'd be doing patrolling and guarding and there'd, there'd be these constant little clashes where individual ships would, would lose and not. And because the speed difference was not significant, if you came across an overwhelming force or were surprised by an overwhelming force, you'd just sail away. And so, you know, unless there was purpose and a reason for the clash to occur, in a lot of cases the minor skirmishes would have resulted in very little damage to many of the ships. But the presence would have been there, and as I said before, the Liburners and some of the lighter triremes were there for patrolling and escort, but also reconnaissance and scouting, so that would provide information back. But again, you know there's an enemy fleet there, and you are, you know, a trireme, eight or nine knots, you've got to get back. You know, you don't have a carrier pigeon or, a, you know, or um, a telegraph or radio or anything, so you've actually got to get back, report it. So the timeliness of some of that intelligence is probably uh, somewhat limited. The Battle of Cape Economist probably has the um, um, position of being probably the largest naval battle in history. It's 700 odd ships. There were not too many other naval battles that involved 700 odd ships, even in modernity. It's just um, unheard of. So um, this was the biggest clash. I suspect Carthaginian wanted to, Carth uh, Carthage wanted to stamp their um, authority on this and make up for the previous uh, um, defeat and um, ensure that they crush Rome's naval, uh, naval uh, ambitions in one, uh, one battle. Um, the background behind this was after the first um, invasion in Sicily and because uh, there was a bit of a standstill, uh, a standoff I should say, uh, Rome had decided that they had the capacity, and quite rightly so, to invade North Africa, which was a major, uh, North Af a major client state to uh, Carthage. So they decided to mount the a major expedition to invade North Africa. So that involved numerous transports, the majority of their navy, and it was simply going to sail from uh, Rome, Sicily, through the Sicilian Straits, into North Africa, land and dis. Um, dis uh, yeah, disgorge all of these. Uh, this. um, disgorge all these um, army, and I think it was about 40,000 40, uh, legions. It was a major, significant effort. And with uh, Carthage, would have been overstretched, and as they were, um, uh, they suffered fairly. You know, they were pretty much unable to deal with this, uh, this invasion. Most of their ships were around Sicily, um, as we are about to find out. Um, so, in um, southern Sicily, on the Cape e Economus, uh, which is here, the um, Roman fleet, with all its transports, uh, ended up sailing by and were, uh, were met by the Carthaginian uh, the navy, which had been uh, prepared and uh, ready to, uh, to meet them. Naval commander was Hamilcar and Hanno the Great. Uh, possessed something uh, about 350 ships, 150,000 rowers and marines. Rome, uh, under the consuls of Regulus, Regulus and uh, Longus, uh, had a similar size, 330 ships, 140,000 uh, rowers and marines. And again, by this time, most of the ships had been fitted with the Corvus. That's the warships, that is. The Roman expeditionary force sailed along the Sicilian coast towards North Africa. They had three squadrons um, in a V formation, which was a fairly common and easy to control because obviously the flagships and the, uh, the, the better quality ships were out in the front and the flanks would then just uh, follow and you'd actually then, um, being a V formation, you'd uh, um, then protect uh, the right flank and, uh, or the left flank, depending on which uh, one you were on. Followed by the transports and the third squadron, <coughs> acted as a rear guard. The main important the reason for that was they didn't want the um, Carthaginians to come up behind the main fleet and attack the transports, so they had quite reasonably uh, a rear guard. The Carthaginians were prepared and uh, ready, expected. They'd, they'd heard about the invasion. Um, you can't hide this scale of invasion. Um, you know, too hard, and there were so many people and loose lips sink ships and all that World War II adage, etc. It certainly applied to uh, local, uh, the local intelligence gathered. Um, 
Hamilcar commanded the centre and Hanno commanded the right flank and I've got a little graphic to show you how that, uh, the battle transpired. Um, on sighting each other, the, the Romans advanced to attack the threat, so the Carthaginians would have appeared on the horizon in battle formation and uh, the Roman forward squadrons would have then advanced to put as much distance between them and the, the transports and uh, with a degree of confidence, having uh, fought them to a, uh, to a victory last time, decided to you know, engage them at the earliest chance. Hamilcar's centre squadron feigned a retreat. In other words, as the Romans came up, uh, they decided they turned round and basically um, uh, started to withdraw uh, from the battlefield. And of course, the Romans, um, bloodlust and wanting victory and thinking this is great, um, pursued them. Of course, uh, what that then did we created a substantial gap between the defending. Um, uh, I'd have sacked the admiral. I'd have said, you know, he should have come back to the transports, but that's all right. Um, so they pursued them, and uh, the gap was created, and um, uh, then uh, the Carthaginian other naval commander then went after the transports. So the two flanking squadrons um, of the Carthaginians, uh, with the centre being pursued by the Roman squadrons, uh, uh, they then bypassed the Roman squadrons and went after the transports. The Roman rearguard, quite naturally, main job was to protect the transports, uh, went forward to defend and engage Hanno's ships. So we've got Han Hamilcar drawing the Roman main battle fleet away, the, tr the transports here being defended by one squadron of um, uh, Romans and uh, Hanno ships being engaging and fighting that battle. So they'd have drove in very quickly and engaged in close combat again and using the Corvus would have, um, and if you remember the stats, the number of ships were roughly about the same, uh, they would have engaged them because they would have had to dealt with the, um, the warships first, the Carthaginians needed to finish off the warships so that they could then attack the transports. The uh, transports moved a little closer to the, the coast to get away from the battle, as a good transport commander would, and uh, the battle then uh, um, um, progressed. The um, Hamilcar's um, squ centre squadron uh, then turned round and engaged uh, the oncoming Romans, um, because obviously that was part of their battle plan and it worked quite well, a fairly common thing, and the Roman ships in heavy close quarter fighting. But they failed to win that battle. Again, the Corvus had given them a sufficient edge and um, the Carthaginian fights, uh, ships were be being engaged, captured and then sunk. And of course, once you've got a Roman crew on the Carthaginian ship, it could then go after um, um, maybe the other ones, but it certainly wasn't a threat. They'd release the Corvus, wind it back up, and then go after another ship as well. Um, in, uh, in a reasonable amount of time, despite heavy fighting, uh, the, uh, uh, the Carthaginians had to withdraw which now left um, the Roman rearguard had continued to engage Hanno, um, but now that Hanno, um, Hamilcar had finished off, uh, been dealt with, the two forward squadrons then returned and then uh, came back and helped defeat Hanno. Hanno must have, um, I think, a substantial number of ships would have then surrendered because, frankly, seeing two squadrons returning and being engaged already with one squadron being the, the meat in the sandwich, so to speak, um, he only really had one option. So this is a bit of a, a graphic for um, the three phases, I guess, of the battle. As, so this is the Carthaginian uh, fleet. Um, it's met the coast of Cis Cis southern Cis Sicily, the two forward squadrons, the transports, and here is the rear guard. Um, so quite the, uh, the Carthaginians um, do the feint draw the uh, two uh, sh warship squadrons forward, uh, leaving the smaller flank guards to uh, uh, try and attack the transports. The rear guard then comes forward to meet them. Transports are again hugging the coast and they were in a little bit of a jeopardy, but the timing of the uh, return in the third phase was basically um, the returning of the, the two combat squadrons uh, back in to defeat this. This is Hanno, caught between two squadrons and in a significant amount of trouble, and this larger squadron was able to deal with this. And as soon as they saw these guys coming, uh, they would have uh, started to try and uh, get away. So, yep. given the amount of time between the two battles, why haven't the Carthaginians developed the corpus? 
Um, probably a degree of complacency, uh, well, there'd be, there'd be two or three reasons, but um, there'd be a degree of arrogance or, uh, of, and, and belief in self-belief because they've been masters of the ocean for so long and you know what it's like when, you're, when the dockers lose, they got lucky or, you know, um, so there'd be so, some of that and, and a belief system in themselves and maybe new commanders or they didn't get it right on the day or, or a range of that. Uh, but the primary reason was that they wouldn't have had the engineering capacity um, that the Romans have um, and the, probably the stores in some of those uh, cities to actually build, uh, build them. And again, you know what it's like. The Romans would have invented and known this and know how it worked and trained with it. Um, the, um, uh, the Carthaginians probably would, would not have. And the final thing is probably most of the ships that got captured with the Corvus would have been captured and their crews dealt with and the people that got away didn't have that experience. But so I think there's probably all of those sorts of things would have probably um, created that uh, reason. I have a later question. Mm -hmm. Sorry about this. That's right. Um, most of that coast of Africa that constituted Carthage nowadays is not really heavily forested. <coughs> yep. 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 That's probably why Carthage isn't got much timber. <laughs> That's probably why, where it's all gone. No, no, seriously speaking, I mean, when you go to Lebanon and those, and you're hard pressed to find uh, those large trees because, you know, century, cedars, yeah, it's, I mean, it's on their flag, wasn't it? Um, you know, the cedar, uh, it, it's all gone. Um, centuries of shipbuilding and construction um, uh, of multiple trees would devastate uh, forests and so And you take the big trees first and then what you needed to. And certainly being a maritime nation, you could draw resources from uh, certainly um, a range of other places. And as you saw, their empire was reasonably large, so they were able to draw from you know, Spain and other places as well. But that takes time, um, whereas I think uh, Italy had access to a lot of timber right on their shoreline. It's because they hadn't been building at the same level at all. So, so in summary, this was the second substantial defeat for the Carthaginians. Uh, two out of two, it's looking good, uh, for the Romans that is. Uh, less than half of the Carthaginian fleet returned and 30 ships were sunk and 65 captured. Again, that's attributed to the Corvus. So it's a lot easier to capture warships, despite some damage, no doubt. Um, but for my own thinking, if this Corvus was as effective as what the numbers are telling me, um, those ships would not be that substantially damaged. It's the crews that would have got vacated. I mean, 40... Um, 40 legionnaires just running up and you know with their uh, short swords and a bit of an angry attitude you're going to get out of that ship or put your hands up or very very quickly um, I mean yeah I've been level one trained with uh, trying to defend in my loin skin and my oar but you know it's just, just not going to work so um, <clears throat> once, your, once your military escort on board your ship has gone um, as a crew and their captains I think you're going to be yeah, putting your hands up um, the Romans landed in Sicily uh, for repairs because remember that they were going to North Africa so they did suffer some damage in the ships because the Carthaginians would have been doing ramming and destroying oars and doing that naval combat stuff um, and then uncontested landed its army in, in North Africa. So again this is now the second major battle which Carthaginia had put in place in order to, to regain the ascendancy and out of it they lost more ships, more sailors, more crew and all and the experienced captains as well. So I mean it's not only the cap loss of the ships, it's, it's that uh, experience base of commanders that have been fighting and uh, you know, you know, the seamanship uh, loss that would uh, be harder to replace than the actual ships. So since um, the battle 15 years earlier, um, things move a little slower time-wise, time and some of these are long wars. Um, Rome had actually um, lost much of its navy in devastating storms. Um, just to step back a little, that huge fleet that had gone over and dropped off um, uh, those legions in North Africa, um, they had done quite well, lots of um, loot and uh, you know, you know, the riches they had gained and territory, um, but they uh, then withdrew a lot of their forces uh, and they were caught in some devastating storms and they lost hundreds 
and of ships and thousands of troops um, because they weren't uh, able to deal with uh, the weather. They lost so many ships. It's, uh, I've got a number here and I'll get to that in a little but it was uh, it's something like 100,000 men were lost in these storms of moving from North Africa back to, um, to Rome uh, and Sicily. It's that experience about reading the weather and that seamanship which uh, money and um, uh, money and the engineers and the resources can't buy you. That experience about reading the weather because the storms and these ships, as I said in my very first um, uh, slide, were com not uh, seaworthy. And when you've got, as I said, one ton corvuses, which they would have still had on the many ships because they would have seen that as the, the, the edge they had over the Carthaginians, <coughs> Um, they were fitted to the ships would have made them significantly uh, unstable. And as I said, most of these guys could not swim. Uh, Rome, uh, subsequently during that 15 year period, realised that it would need to um, you know, uh, try and finalise the Sicilian campaign, uh, rebuilt um, another 200 ships with public subscriptions. Uh, how many of you would like to buy a trireme or quinquireme? Um, some, uh, um, not quite sure what the cost is, it'd be an interesting question, um, but through public subscriptions, because the Navy, uh, the long war in Sicily had, was getting expensive, but um, uh, they ended up through public subscriptions and it was a technique used by uh, um, the English in World War II and you could name a bom bomber and build a bomber and, and so did the Russians building and naming tanks, uh, so did the, um, the, um, the Romans, they ended up rebuilding uh, 200 of the ships so that they had a navy to uh, prosecute the uh, Sicilian campaign. Uh, Rome dispatched his fleet to blockade the last two Carthage ports in uh, Sicily. Uh, they were on that uh, west coast. And I'll just show you a graphic. Um, and uh, of interest are the uh, Aegean uh, islands in western Sic Sicily. Um, that's that uh, graphic again. And as you can see, um, the Legate Islands has a significance uh, to this. The two cities, uh, Lilibeum Berum, uh, is here, and this is uh, Dupanium. These were the two cities that were held by, the last two major cities held by Carthage. And the aim of the, um, of the Romans was to put a block blockade um, uh, here and stop uh, supplies of soldiers and weapons, food uh, coming in, and so the, these two cities were going to be besieged and surrendered. And as I said uh, before, they wouldn't simply park a, a, sh um, a load of ships around each of the ports to stop them. They would base outside, um, close to it, and then react um, having probably sh uh, ships ready to go at the moment's notice of when uh, uh, the um, uh, Carthaginian resupply ships turned up. Carthage um, naval commander was Hanno the Great. He had 250 odd ships, including um, a number of transports. Rome um, consuls were uh, Gaius Lutatius Catullus and uh, Praetor uh, Fauto. Uh, they had about 200 ships. Um, they had by this time removed the Corvus, and there's a couple of reasons why. But one of the observations made by uh, a um, number of the authors now is that um, they were better trained and more experienced, they had better trained and more experienced crews than the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians had lost so many experienced crews in the previous naval battles that they had some great difficulty in replacing the crews and at some difficulty they replaced the ships. So it was a bit of a mixed bag so despite them being outnumbered this time, almost directly proportional uh, uh, to the previous battles where um, the Carthaginians were the experienced um, uh, naval commanders and less ships and the Romans were, you know, had more ships but less experience. Um, now we find those roles transposed and the Romans had the ascendancy in seamanship and skills and uh, the Carthaginians had poorly trained, incomplete crews and one of, apparently uh, one of the narratives suggests that they didn't have too many marines or deck soldiers because most of them were in some of these cities and defending North Africa and Carth Carthage because they had expected uh, attacks. So the theory had been that the supply ships and some of the, the warships would have gone into those two cities 
dropped off supplies and re some reinforcements and then picked up their deck soldiers to fight uh, the battle. You can see what's coming up, can't you? Um, so the Romans had removed the Corvus and the other thing, those, west, uh, those western seas were more exposed. They were rougher and more difficult. They were exposed to the weather. The sea states were more uh, difficult rather than between Rome and Sicily where the seas tend to be a lot calmer. So the Roman Navy arrives and blockades the ports of Lilibam and Masala now and Drapanda and Hanno shortly arrives to break the blockade and, and pauses at those uh, gate islands to wait for favourable winds. So there's an indicator here that he's got his sails up because if you've got favourable winds you, don't need, you, don't, you know, don't need your oars. So he's got his, um, his sails up which is making his ships less manoeuvrable they're faster with a favourable wind, but they're less manoeuvrable and they're heavier, so they're slower to react. Uh, the Carthaginians were found um, by scouts, so the Roman navy were warned that these guys had arrived at the, um, the islands, at the Agates Islands. Um, so the Roman um, fleet was stripped uh, for battle and prepared to attack Hanno. So they ended up being like this, stripped decks cleared, all the ancillary stuff removed and uh, their soldiers put on, on board ready to, uh, to fight them. The Carthaginian fleet was heavy, it had been loaded with supplies and equipment because that was their role to get supplies um, uh, back into these cities. Um, but they had few troops as I'd already mentioned and their, troops and their crews were inexperienced. Falto, Catullus had actually been now had been injured in a previous engagement, uh, led the attack, and in short order, uh, the Roman squadrons decimated the Carthaginian fleet in the naval tradition, not with the Corvus, but by manoeuvring, ramming, destroying oars, and boarding um, the Carthaginians. In this, it was a decisive naval battle, with over half of the fleet was lost, with 50 ships sunk and 70 captured. So. Those figures indicate to me, again, it's that naval tradition rather than the Corvus, where the ships were actually sunk, 50 of them or so, um, by ramming destruction of oars and uh, that sort of thing. Seventy captured belies the fact that <coughs> out of that 350 um, ships, some of them transports and some of them the warships, um, 70 captured would indicate that they probably saw the writing on the wall and trapped by numerous things would have surrendered um, their, uh, their ships to the Romans. So a very significant, over 120 ships um, of that Carthaginian fleet uh, were dealt with. This was the third, and substantial, third substantial defeat of the Carthaginian navy by Rome. The Carthaginian ships were less manoeuvrable, as I've already suggested, and the Romans had been stripped for battle. So with less than half the Carthaginian fleet returning, thanks only to favourable winds, which is again apparently uh, the winds had changed direction and were able to assist and basically the, uh, the um, Carthaginian fleet hoisted their sails, picked up their wind and uh, got out of there very quickly um, and the blockade of the Sicilian ports was still in place. Um, so the Carthaginian uh, Senate had no option but loss of fleet, the blockade in place, not, uh, ha not having been resupplied, uh, sort of peace. So, in summary, the aftermath, unable to replace its naval losses, Carthage, in, Carthage settled with uh, um, Rome, the First Punic War, significantly to Rome's advantage. Uh, Carthage had to vacate Sicily and Sardinia, um, and they had to pay a substantial amount of money, and a debt continued. The Carthage, na Carthage Navy was reduced to a mere 50 ships, merely enough to deal with pirates, basically. Uh, and Rome's fleet continued to increase despite its major losses at sea, as I said, mainly due to storms. They still had some lessons to learn. Um, the Roman navy, the Punic Wars and conquest of the Mediterranean reached a level of fleet size that would not be matched until the 19th century. So the number of ships, that's the 19th century. The number of ships, the organisation, the, the area of operations, uh, and if you just extend your minds a little thinking about Caesar, how did Caesar invade Britain? The Roman navy was there. You know, 
um, Gaul, the rivers in France and all of those, uh, you know, the transition of war ships uh, like the Vikings were to do um, hundreds of years later, you know, the, the entry and the use of the navy in uh, the river arena and the river uh, m made the job of the army so much better, easier. It set the preconditions for, um, for the Second Punic War and Rome's navy ruled the seas for the next six centuries. Um, pretty impressive when you read that history. Brings a tear to my eyes an infantryman, I've got to say. Um, naval technology went through a transformation during, during the Punic Wars. Um, obviously not only the cor Corvus, but uh, the Harpax, a development in uh, tactics, um, but more importantly, the development of shipbuilding and training crews to man them. If you had that capacity to build quickly and maintain true troops to a threat, you didn't have to maintain such a big standing navy because you know you're given a three month lead time that you could get that to that state. So that was very cost effective. Um, Rome was also about spending money but it was also about saving money as well. Um, naval operations were now essential to and integrated into the campaign planning of Rome. Um, they saw the utility and the advantages and you'll find that most major campaigns of Rome now incorporated uh, the Navy in a support and security role. Issue of pirates still remained an issue. Issue of pirates? Um, the pirates still remained an issue with um, uh, uh, the Mediterranean for a long time. There were lots of uh, uh, minor states and villages and cities, etc., that um, you know uh, supported pirates mainly because it, they paid them, got income and uh, uh, housemen, and that was <clears throat> that was to be settled by uh, Pompey um, in 67 BCE. Um, I th oh, I'll just go back. Sorry. Oh. Give me one moment. I'll just go back. Do it this way. Right. So um, the pirates um, were still an issue until Pompey dealt with them. Um, Pompey um, in 66 BC, um, he was given 20 legions. So this is how big the pirate problem was. He was given 20 legions, that's 120,000 men, 270 ships, um, 270 ships, Pompey. Oh, Pompey, sorry. Yeah. Pompey, thank you, my mistake. He was killed in Egypt. Yes, later. Well, it got on the wrong side again. Well, anyway, it happens. Um, so Pompey um, uh, was given a task to clear the pirates and he ended up doing so. And the last major Roman sea battle, there were other Roman battles uh, in between uh, as they continued to expand and become uh, um, you know, the, um, the sea power that they were to be. Um, was the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Um, so the tactical summary, initially Carthage commanders had dismissed Rome's uh, naval competency and tenacity and failed to respect their adversity, adversary. Um, Rome was able to use surprise effectively on two of the battles uh, using the Corv Corvix, Corvus and gain tactical ascendancy uh, and reduce what Carthage had, which was um, its um, seamanship and its ability to, uh, um, you know, win the naval battles. And more importantly, Carthage had a uh, few reserves. Rome, in contrast, could um, replace ships, replace crews um, relatively easily, uh, whereas Carthage was struggling financially and resource to be able to do so. It was an attritional war. Uh, Carthage could not lose 200 ships. Rome could and did and replace them with another 200 ships um, so they were able to win that war uh, and frankly uh, Rome possessed a single aim uh, the destruction of Carthage and there's been a number of books that have been <laughs> written on that um, just a couple of acknowledgements on some books and stuff the music was um, by Invincible um, a couple of books here by Osprey, if you're familiar with those titles, they do a lot of uh, military things. They're very good, light read, in an afternoon over a beer, red wine or a cup of tea. Um, so I would commend them for um, those. So the Osprey range, um, I sell in my shop by the way, um, 
late in uh, selling, but you can get them anywhere. An extremely good resource uh, for level one reading and, and quite and you know quite scholarly supported. So very very good. Um, my favourite book on the Roman Army, uh, Roman Navy, so is Roman Sh Warships by uh, Michael Patassi. Great read, and it goes into a, a, a so much detail. Um, probably too much sometimes, but um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's well worth um, getting out of the library or buying if you're interested in that sort of stuff. There's those two books, and I'll leave you with that. <laughs> <laughs> Any final questions? Yes? Okay, <clears throat> to go from stripping, uh, this is part of the reason why I bought these two, had these two ships. This has got sails on and war towers and things like that. Um, whereas this one has been stripped of the main mass, which is normally, uh, that's stripped um, basically. And anything uh, that they don't need, they just take off to reduce weight, increase uh, mobility. Uh, and I suggest they probably put an extra barrel to of, rum, uh, of wine um, in the decks, etc. Yes. So, uh, well, they do also. They they would put the soldiers on as well. But yeah. But the whole whole war was caused because Rome wanted to expand because they just lost Egypt to the Ptolemies. Yep. And they want they were having trouble getting anywhere in Spain and Sicily because the Greek settlers had gone there to avoid the Persians. 150 years before. I suspect that's the case and for Carthaginian every single war. Carthaginians didn't want a war. The Romans wanted to get rid of Carthaginian influence so they could expand. Correct, yes. Absolutely. That, um, yeah. and tell me which wars have um, um, not been done from uh, the expansion, etc. And certainly, um, is Rome a bully? Absolutely. But he had a big stick in um, the opportunity and Carthaginian was the... Yes, and yes. Caesar had trouble with Greek settlers in Marseille. I suspect that's probably true. Mm. He had to write home and explain that. Yes. Um, uh, one of the Carthaginian, Carthaginian naval commanders was, was called Hanno the Great. Why was he called the Great? Uh, probably because he was either a very robust gentleman or um, he had naval successes and was well-renowned well, well as well. Um, and oh, by the way, the guy that did uh, lead that battle, when he got back, he was crucified as well. So, <laughs> so it seems to be a common theme. Yes? Uh, you said that the ships, the ships were put into port, taken out, so that they wouldn't get caught along. What about the crew? Were they the same with the next day? Um, I would suggest that the next day, pretty much, except those that were drunk and didn't turn up, uh, those that were sick, and you'd have a, you know, those administration people would make sure there was a full crew. You'd have a, a number of people that would be available as crew. And, uh, contact between ships, how was it done? Flags, or did they yell at one another? Uh, no flags, yell, um, wave, made directions, sway, ooh, ah, you know. <laughs> Um, they certainly had um, trumpets and those sorts of things, uh, so they would have had drills, and, and certainly um, um, I, I would suspect they would have trained in each of the squadrons, cause, so that they wouldn't, you know, 10-man squadrons, they would have had a leader within, a naval commander within that group, and they would have practiced basic drills, uh, how to attack and defend and those sorts of things, etc. And for operations, like a major operations, where they were positioned, uh, they would have conferences beforehand, like most military commanders, etc. So. Yeah. Exactly the same way they got them out. You, hundred and uh, some of the numbers. It takes about one hundred and forty men to get a ship out, and it, just sh yeah. And one you could do rollers, uh, and one you could just haul it up. Um, there's some rec records of triremes being carried, carried by. And you got enough men. It's like the ants, uh, number of ants, etc. So, yeah. Yeah, you you could carry them over is isthmuses and things like that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. And for those that have grandchildren, just a wild guess, Lego does a uh, tri-ring.
Mike, thanks very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much.